Hi. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Welcome. Welcome to Uncoachable, a podcast for parents and coaches by parents and coaches. Thank you, Coach Logan. Coach Patrick doesn't know how to do math. I think we've established this already, but I just want to make sure I point it out again. Right. Well, on air. We, we know. <laughs> Publicly. <laughs> so we're going to pick up right where we left off on last episode. If you haven't listened to the last episode, go listen to that one first. We're going we're gonna to pick it up right where we left off with uh, the ginger hair, ginger hair genius over here, Rusty Plunkett. Thank you for joining us again. This may become a staple. Yeah. And uh, by staple, I mean like a weekly staple. Just for you guys that are... that are. He may get bored of it, though. Yeah, well... Me I or you? <laughs> I got a little bored of it. He's going to get, gonna get <laughs> bored of you. You took over my talking points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you that are wondering, Coach Lance forgot Joe Boo. So that's why we have not spoke of Joe Boo yet. If we, well, now he's that you here. did, we're screwed. He's not here. Feel free to publicly shame him. Mm-hmm. Shame. Yeah, I know. So shame. we're. If anybody has a uh, chicken that they're okay but, with a sacrifice, but I, you know, you know, you know what? I think I think we would have had Send some rum. quarrels, if you will, if I bring Joe Boo, and we have a ginger hair genius here. There may be some issues. Alpha males. Not alpha males. Just you know, you, you get the different the different kinetic energies going, and it just doesn't work very well. I don't feel like ginger hair genius can stick if uh, the other guy doesn't stick. I don't think we've introduced him as the other guy. Either oh, episode. You're so right. You, you are correct. That is my bad. Yeah, because <laughs> that's my fault. Yeah, you didn't introduce anybody. Coach Logan, Coach Lance. Oh, we don't care about that. I don't care about you guys. We're, <laughs> we're here for Rusty. We are. Here you for guys Rusty. are here all the time. You're right. So the other guy. Yeah. What's that up? Was, I was, the only reason I did that is because <laughs> okay. we weren't Facebook friends. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. I could tag these guys. I couldn't tag you. So you just became the other guy. <laughs> He's not on Facebook. Is anyway. that the only that's reason? That's okay. No, I didn't know his name. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure we were clear. Because <laughs> the okay. second I read that, I go, he did, he did not remember his name. And it's okay. Well, me and Coach uh, Lance. I could have just went to the website and looked. But I don't I don't feel like you guys are listed as hosts on your Facebook page, though. Are you? Because I think I went there first, and I couldn't find his name. So then I went the other guy. So well, then I went, not, he's so then I went to the website. He's not on I'm Facebook. just saying on your yeah. uh, uncoachable Facebook page, yeah. I don't think you have you guys as hosts listed in your like about session section. Oh, Probably not. Yeah. It's not about us. It's about the kids, Rusty. Why are you on the website then? <laughs> dun dun dun. Ginger haired genius has them on the ropes. Yes. <laughs> because I want people to go to our website. He's, he's searching for a two by four to pull out of his trousers. He can't find one. No. I can find one. I can't get it out. That's a problem. <laughs> Now he's looking for the folding chair. <laughs> you don't know how to pull it out? Dude, that's a pro- yeah. That's, that's why I got three that's kids. Why <laughs> um, <laughs> no, because I want people to go to the website to learn about it. I'm a us. professional. We can't talk like this. <laughs> that is true. He could lose his job over this. Have we said where I work? I did. Oh, crap. For the first time. Anything one. I say is not <laughs> the views or expressions of the place that I work. <laughs> You're right. We probably should have said that. <laughs> good point. Oh, well. Do we need to start over? <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll Again, edit that one out. Wives and mothers. We, we've <laughs> <laughs> For now. For now. We, we've started over on several episodes, just so you know. If we need to. <laughs> Anywho. So, yeah. The we, other guy knows how to edit if need be. Yeah. Well. That's why he's we here. Kind of. We think. He, he tells us we've not really done that, other than what other time? than what I told somebody. <laughs> did you? Did I you listened to that. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely bleeped an f bomb one episode. <laughs> I mean, I was heated. I was heated. <laughs> I really was to the point where I was like hitting the dump, <laughs> dump, 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 dump. Just turned out to be the Staples Easy button that does not connect to anything. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. That was easy. That was easy. <laughs> So you got notes over there. I I just have one thing written down. It's not called <laughs> notes. <laughs> and it's word. not spelled correctly. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise there either. They're just very... notes. They don't have to be spelled correctly. <laughs> I can I can hear you misspelling words when you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there a capital letter in the middle of a word here? <laughs> so uh, basically, we're going to tie this really really into baseball where. We talk about sabermetrics all the time, and sabermetrics are the new information. 
and I always brust, bristle at the Hawk Harrelsons of the world that want to tell you how useless sabermetrics are. And the people that really get it, it's just another form of information. That's all it is. And why would you want to deprive yourself of information? Even if you don't use it, at least you have it. Okay, so, and we talked about this in the last episode. We talked about the, the, the differences between the old school version of using ice and now the new school of, of not using ice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just new information. It's mm-hmm. different information. Yes. How to how do we take stuff like that and really able to differentiate? What do we need to know? What do we need to look for in determining what is good information? What is bad information? Is that a question for me? It yep. is. If you have an answer, I don't know if. So I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a mathematician or a sabermetrician. What are those guys called? Sabermetricians. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, no, so... You made a word up, but it's okay. I, I think the it's way... The whole sabermetrics is made up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the way that you look at it is exactly like you're saying, is that it's just information to validate that what you're doing is working. But what if I can find information out there that... It's validating what I'm doing, but what I'm doing is wrong. I think is what kind of what you're getting at. Am I well, right? I'm talking about like so we have all this information that yep. we've that we've compiled since the 1940s, and then all of a sudden in 2012, 2015, 2019, when we get new information and the technology is there and it's better, does that necessarily make it the best information, or is the old stuff still valid? Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I think it depends on which information you're looking at. I, I think there's probably some stuff that's outdated and maybe not as valuable as the new stuff. And I.e., think... batting average, right? If we're going to talk sabermetrics, batting average is outdated at this point. Right, right. And, and, right. And, batting average, maybe even like RBIs and stuff like that, right? It, it well, all depends on your opportunity. Right. So I think that's where sabermetrics comes in. But I, I think, you know, ideally what I would love to see, and again, just because I'm a physical therapist, I'm hijacking the podcast more or less is that I would love to see a sabermetric that identifies injury risk of some sort. And I don't know that that's out there, but you know, if you could put a number on a guy and say that he has X amount likelihood of being injured within the next five years based on criteria A, B, and C, I might be like a really rich guy right now. Cause I would sell that to the MLB in some way. I don't know that that's, proprietary in well, any means like but last episode try. last episode we talked about chris sale perfect example thank you 150 percent likelihood he's going to be injured in the next five years <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> your arms are not supposed to move like that the fact that he's not been severely injured right is right so and the fact that mark Pryor was off injured in the but part- mark Pryor was off injured not because of his throwing mechanics. Though. It ended up it ended up being that way. But he, he had a lot of freak injuries that are just, you know, yeah. tripping over Marcus Giles right. and getting hit with a line drive back in there. But I, I think that part of of what we're looking at there's a component that we can't see, right? There there are biological factors that make player A more susceptible to injury as opposed to Chris Sale, right? Mm-hmm. So if player A pitches like Chris Sale, he's going to get hurt. Chris Sale pitches like Chris Sale, and he doesn't get hurt, probably for the same reason that God reached down and touched his arm with a major league throwing arm. He also blessed him with very strong ligaments and tendons that perhaps are outside of the realm of any sort of training that anybody could do, right? Chris Sale could be super lazy, Right, he could never work on his arm, and he may never get hurt. Where the other guy is working nonstop to take care of his arm, and he still just for whatever reason is getting hurt. Right, so there's there's a component that we can't see biologically. So yeah, if I look at Chris Sale face value, and I look at you know the way his arm moves, and and probably the amount of torque that he's putting through his elbow every single time he pitches, I would cringe, but. He's Chris Sale, and he has apparently been given some pretty decent biological factors that have left him to not be injured. So nothing that we do 
is going to be 100% accurate, right? I, I could say all day long that Chris Sale is going to get injured in the next five years, and then he doesn't because of whatever reason. Right? And so that was what that was what my ultimately what my question was about, similar to your workout question. I was trying to tie it in because working out and, and oh, that's where that went. Yeah. Okay, I, was, I got you. I was trying to tie them together. That was an hour ago for those of you listening. Go listen to the last podcast before you listen to this one. But but I was trying to tie that in because working out can be good for a 12-year-old or it could be bad for a 12-year-old. If if it's whether it's done improperly or not, it could just their body their body could just not be used I think, to it. I think the name of the game is highly supervised workout. Absolutely. Yeah, I I don't think that working out for a certain individual could be bad if done properly. Or, can I say that? Agree. I think that working out isn't inherently bad but when it comes to pitching and the amount of force that goes through the elbow and the shoulder every time you pitch that's something that's outside of our control right so if i lift a one pound dumbbell versus lifting a 50 pound dumbbell obviously that's different and i mean we could probably take this into weighted ball training and talk about all this stuff too but just at face value playing baseball, you're throwing a five ounce baseball, the forces that go through the arm are astronomical. All right. So I could give you the numbers and tell you that the UCL ruptures at 34 Newton meters, just in a cadaver, right? So you take glass, you you take a cadaver (laughs) and you test that UCL, it ruptures at 34. Every time that you pitch, at least from a major league standpoint, you pitch with 66 newton meters of force right so wow the ucl should tear every single time that you throw but through proper training you protect that ligament with the muscles that also cross the elbow right so that's Mm -hmm. why it doesn't partially and it also doesn't partially because of good mechanics probably and it the doesn't the decel the deceleration on the finish with your legs and having that absorb some of that force as well, or am I wrong? That's part of it. Yep. But most of that force through the elbow is going to be coming through the layback phase where you're taking your arm back and also through the acceleration phase, because as you accelerate your arm, you're creating a whip with your forearm that then places ligament on the, or places stress on the inside ligament on your elbow. Uh, So the muscles that cross the elbow are your forearm muscles. So the stronger that they are, the more your elbow is protected. So more of the deceleration is more rotator cuff type of stuff. Okay. Where elbow stuff is going to be more forearm training. Okay. This is a, okay. Now we're getting into deep. It's now we're getting into some stuff. Lovely. And this is, this is what we love. Mm -hmm. Like this is. So what would you tell a coach that said, I got a kid that came to me and he's got pain in the bicep area from throwing, not in the under elbow portion, but just in the bicep. Is that more inflammation from the rotator cuff? Is that more just lactic acid buildup? It's because it's not really a, a torque muscle there. Yeah. So is it just overuse needing to break through that wall not warm, not about. warming up correctly yeah. not stretching so i would always need things. more information if some, if a coach came to me and gave me that statement at face value i would ask for more information okay right? so uh, when does that pain start how long does it last those are very important pieces if it starts you know a few hours after throwing and it lasts a day probably not pathological i'm not worried about it all right, when you say pathological, elaborate because you use that use that last time. I wanted to get that meaning that there's some sort of injury that deserves closer attention. Okay, uh, but if it's something that lasts for three, four, five days, or maybe a few weeks, then it's obviously something that we need to look at. And they shouldn't be throwing in that time, and they probably just need to be evaluated for any sort of injury first off. And then if we can clear them of any sort of injury and just kind of attribute it to inflammation that is lasting longer than it should, then maybe we need to break down their mechanics and look at, well, why may he be experiencing some of those symptoms? So then let me flip that around and say this is the – I've warmed up, 
and, and, and I can say this from a personal standpoint. I've I've warmed up, maybe not maybe not as much as I should have, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I've warmed up. I go out, I take the field, I get a fly ball hit to me, I catch it, I go to throw it in to 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 get a runner out at third base. Okay, but in the process, I feel my arm get just at that point. I'm putting probably too much torque on it, and I feel my bicep then get sore from that throw. Yeah, you're done for the day. I mean, if you oh, throw, yeah, there's no coming back from it. I know uh, that. Yeah, no, but if you throw one throw and you feel a sudden sharp pain or, or anything, not even a sharp pain. It's like I mean, you've had that tingle. feeling, haven't you? When, yeah, when you've grown where it's like it, it, like you're. I mean, I don't think he's ever like, thrown the ball super hard. Fair enough, but you, well, you're like, ooh, I can't. Like, Me or Lance? <laughs> Either. I was done it. I was done at 14. Like my yeah. my velocity stopped there. <laughs> I feel you. So, you know, you have that, but. Um, it, obviously you can try to play through it and the next time you go to throw it has zero like there's n- you got nothing you can't physically do it because your arm hurts that bad in that moment so that's that's I think one of the questions that you I'm, are I'm asking. actually I'm actually talking more about the different areas of the arm and the different pain means different things yeah absolutely you know like I used to I used to get pain right in the crease of my elbow not on the underside of my elbow when yeah. I would pitch so when you throw the baseball does your elbow go from a flexed position to an extended position? The answer is yes. All right. So anytime that you release the ball, your elbow is extending towards the plate. And like we talked about last podcast, your bicep is the one that controls that amount of elbow extension. All right. So your tricep may initiate that, but your bicep has to control it. All right. So, so that your arm doesn't hinge all the way backwards, right? Your bicep has to control the amount of elbow extension coming from your throwing arm. So that's probably bicep tendon. Oh! Light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. Going off all over the place. Jesus. That's why we had you here. Because I get kids all, all the time that have that have pain up in the bicep area. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's just soreness. general soreness. That's not – there's no – in my mind, that said to me, it's not on the other side of the elbow. It's not on the rotator cuff. So it's not a Major. larger injury. It's just a little bit of inflammation from underuse, and now we're overuse. With the caveat, of course, of that soreness goes away within a, a short, you know, 24 to 48 hour time period. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And there's, um, again, good research out there with. Uh, a document called Soreness Rules. Uh, the The article was written by Michael Axe. Everybody got a pen? Write that down, A-X-E. Uh, but there are soreness rules that go along with not only pitching, but it's really good for, like, start of the season stuff. So now is, uh, like, a really good time to even Beautiful. look at that because not every kid is going to progress, progress fast enough or as fast as his peers, right? It might mm-hmm. take one kid – four weeks to be at full strength it might take another kid six weeks to be at full strength so what this document does is it gives you an algorithm that tells you if you were sore how long did it last does it go away when you do this and at the end of the algorithm it tells you it's okay to throw today or you should not throw today or you maybe you should not throw today and you should back down and throw it a shorter distance next time because you need to build up your strength further before it's okay to progress. So like I said, if you, I don't know what age you guys all coach, but if you coach 10 year olds, there might be one kid that's ready right away. And there might be one kid that it takes a little bit longer to get them ready. And and it kind of works for all age groups. So it doesn't matter if you coach eight, nine, 10, 12, whatever. So it's universal. Yeah. And that, I mean, that might be the most important thing that you've said this entire podcast. Like, it takes not, me a while to get there. Sometimes. Not that not that all of the stuff that you said is not important, right. but like, holy crap! Like that for me, like the last five minutes has just completely blew my head out of the water because I I thought I knew all this stuff and I thought I was pretty well educated on it. It turns out I am not. That's why he's here. I do my best. So, yeah, and, and I think. You alluded to it too. Different different areas of the body means different things. So, you know, in this case, we're talking about elbow being bicep, but you can also have a bicep uh, impingement in the front part of the shoulder. So, if somebody's telling you that the front part of their shoulder hurts, that can still be bicep pain for whatever reason, for, for a different reason. 
um, rather than the elbow extended, it's going to be more controlled, controlling the shoulder. Through and the my mind motion. would automatically go rotator cuff. We have a problem, right? Yeah, and, and that could just again that could be bicep pain. Yeah. Um, typically, if you get out on the outside part of the shoulder, um, out to the side, then it's going to be more rotator cuff related. So that's kind of okay. where um, referred pain from the rot- from the rotator cuff comes in. And that could be a variety of different things. It might be that the shoulder doesn't have enough stability. So if you think about the shoulder, it's a ball and socket joint. So there's a ball that fits into a flat surface, basically. And in the shoulder especially, it's important that, that the ball of the shoulder stays centered within the joint. So what happens is when... Uh, players get up into a throwing position and they start to elevate their arm, the ball rotates up into the flat part of the surface. So rather than staying centered, it starts to rotate higher and that pinches on the rotator cuff. So you can imagine if you're pinching that rotator cuff 50 to 100 times every game, that creates some wear and tear and can obviously cause pain. So that's something that you that typically won't go away in 24 to 48 hours. If that pain stays on the outside of the shoulder for several days, they're probably pinching on their shoulder. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, to me that didn't – that's not something that my mind would immediately go to because I think rotator cuff right on the – right where the, the arm connects to the chest – that makes sense. Like I think that of the, okay, if your arm hurts there, we got a problem. Yeah, but it, it's more on the outside. It, it's the, more on the outside. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's like Dylan. Uh, that's right where he said his arm was hurting and turned out. You know, I talked about he had the inflammation in the growth plates, whatever that is. But mm-hmm. I mean, he he had to almost take a year off. Yeah, and from that throwing. that honestly could be uh, what we talked about earlier too. In that sometimes growth plates get torn away with the muscle where it attaches onto the bone. So perhaps in his case, obviously I don't know him or anything about him, but it could be that that was kind of a precursor to the fracture, to it actually being pulled away. Um, And so that's where some of that inflammation could be coming from. So it maybe wasn't a complete fracture, but it was kind of like right on the border where there was a ton of stress going on through the shoulder where the tendon attached to the bone. And so giving him that time off allowed everything to heal and, and come back together. So and, then, and then that means that mechanically, as far as throwing-wise, he needs to fix his mechanics, correct? Potentially. I mean, there's a ton of different things. Again, You don't there, know, so. There are biological factors that come okay. into it, but it could be mechanical in, in looking at his mechanics. Or, you know, again, I'm assuming he's he was one of your guys, and yeah. I trust that you do things the right way, but it could be an overuse injury too. And I think always what's important to remember with that. And and I always have to be so careful how I talk to coaches about that too, because I, I'm not accusational by any means. Mm -hmm. It's, it just happens. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the way things are structured with more tournament play nowadays that we have to throw kids a little bit closer together. Unless you have a team of 12 players, which by the way, if, if you have eight to 12 year olds I hope that all of them get a chance to pitch because that's the only way to do tournament play in all honesty um, the only way that it should be done the only way that it should be done to keep kids arms safe yes. I, I, I am accusational so I'll take care of that part if you need to <laughs> yeah go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know and that was always a goal of ours as coaching to have from nine to from yeah. nine to, to now even is our goal <clears throat> pardon me our goal is always to to have Every single player be able to pitch when we need the, like if we need them to pitch, they're, they're at least they're, confident they're, they're enough confident to get me go out. and go get an out or throw strikes or whatever it takes. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's important because all kids are different. So um, the MLB has actually put forth um, guidelines called Pitch Smart. So if you're not familiar, you should educate yourself using MLB Pitch Smart guidelines, and it breaks you down age group by age group from eight to. I think 18 or maybe even higher. Um, if a kid throws 30 pitches on one day, 
how many days did that does that mean that he needs to rest for? So if you go into pool play on Friday and you throw a kid for 40 pitches and 40 pitches tells you that at your age group you need to rest that kid for three days, then he can't pitch on Sunday when you're in kind of the championship portion of your bracket, right? So, again, it's it's difficult to manage, um, but that's that's the research, and that's what it says is the safest to do. So, I mean, I think I, How, so I, my getting question. coaches together and being able to develop some sort of philosophy or – you know, some way just to make things safer for kids is, I think, what the sport really needs right now. And I think you guys are on to something with this podcast because I would love to get a room full of the best coaches out there, you know, the best minds and say, hey, if Timmy throws 40 pitches, he's done until Sunday. How can we supplement that? You know, how can, you know, should he play right field? Should he play left field? Should he play shortstop or third base or how can we make it so that all of our kids are getting some experience and, can, and i think can we can hold we on not? i got to i got to get this one out of me because it's something that i i just go crazy about all the time and it's that competitiveness at these levels i don't have anything against being a super competitive team but not every kid is suited to that level of play right so if you have if you actually have a travel ball team i feel and you know i'm going to get back last year but i feel that you should have one team with 12 awesome players that you can pitch at any moment right there's no kids that you're trying to quote unquote hide you know it's 12 of the best of the best and they can all do it all right and that's where we've taken away a little bit from like town ball and, and all those little leagues is that everybody wants to be part of the travel system. And I, you know, I, I love baseball. I love competitive baseball, but I wish that we could look at it from a fundamental basis of, you know, single a, double a, triple a major league baseball, right? There's a developmental system. And if you're playing town ball to get your kid better so that he can be in the MLB, so to speak, and be able to play on these competitive travel teams, that's how you create a safe environment for kids because no longer are you having to hide three or four kids from the pitching mound and you have to rely on your horse to come in on Sunday when he just pitched a complete game on Friday so that you could be the top ranked team in your bracket, right? So you got 12 kids that can do it all. You're not trying to hide anybody and everybody else is just working through league play and whatever and, and developing and getting better. So, so you're talking essentially, if we will, an all-star team. More or less. Well, yeah. That, that comes with that comes with what we, like we've talked about before. Dad gets pissed off. That's that's what was going to be my question. Is so then your philosophy is we have too many travel ball teams, travel ball organizations in play already because you have because it's so easy to then just just make a team make a team. Correct. Yeah, and yeah, I would. That, and, that's and, what and, I would say. And I, I would, I would feel if you went and you talked to ten coaches, if you went and talked to fifty coaches, you're going to get ninety five percent of them all agree to that because you can't actually. With the organization we are in, there is no way we could field an all star team, if you will, where all eleven, twelve players were able to play every position at any moment in time. And, and, it, honestly, and that was our goal, mind you. Sorry, that was our goal, mind you, is to be able to be able to pitch anybody in any situation and and not have it be a problem competently. Right. Yeah. So again, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or, or you're not you you're know, fine. Say anything that makes anybody sour about anything, but you have to look at. I guess the crop of which you're choosing from too, right? Is your pool too small that you can't feel the team that does all that, right? You're limiting your boundaries as yes. to what players can play on your team. True. And that's why you can't find the players that are skilled enough to do so. Right. The reason that we hide players again, I don't like to use that word, but the reason that we hide players in the field or, or we don't let them see the mound is because they're not good. Fact of the matter right. is, it's true. It's because we're not, we can't win with those players. Fact of the matter is, that's true. And, so and there's you, no you hit it on the head. You can't win with that player pitching per se. Right. So why not develop? And and I know we kind of do it with 
was it single A, double A majors? That's the that's is the that goal a of it. Classification system now. It is, uh, but yeah. we don't use it appropriately. Single A, double A, triple A majors. It's not used appropriately because even at a double A level, where you may not be having your all star team put together, if you will, because to me the all star team would be your elite or your major level, if you will. Double A, at that point in time, winning is not important at all. Because all that matters at that point is development, and you should your goal should be to get every player able to pitch properly, and be able to put them on the mound at any point in time whenever you feel necessary. But when Daddy Dipshit decides that you're not winning enough tournaments, Double A, he's going to go stomp off and start his own team. Right. That's the problem. Is there's so many parents out there that they think they can do it better. Yeah. So it it goes back to one of the previous podcasts in yes. winning over development. Right. right. So. That's what it all comes down to. It, we can talk about development and why it's good for kids, but at the end of the day, it's it's what keeps our kids healthy too, and a lo- it gives them the best chance to be able to play baseball for as long as possible. Yes. Right? If you yep. have a workhorse on your team who you have to use because four or five of your guys can't pitch, so you don't have enough pitching depth to be able to go out there and pitch – every two or three days or whatever it is, you are robbing, potentially robbing him of the rest of his baseball career because by the time he's 14, he's injured his arm so much that he can no longer take the mound, right? He maybe will get to play at JUCO potentially, but if you have a lot of arm health issues, you're not going to be able to play for a long time. You're not going to be able to reach your full potential, right? My biggest thing is, are you trying to sacrifice winning at the age of 12 when this kid could be 18, 20, 22 and a potential, you know, draft pick, but you burn him out at 12 trying to to win a, a national championship at the 12 mid, years old? The Midwest shootout. <laughs> yeah, and vice versa. You're leaving that kid behind who's never getting a chance to pitch. And, yeah, he's obviously not going to be the greatest at it the first couple times you throw him out there, but maybe by the end of the season if he's had enough opportunities – or in a year or two, if he gets enough opportunities, eventually he could turn into a pitcher and And by learn. the time he's 14, he hates baseball and he doesn't want to play in high school anymore because he's burned he, out. he never got a chance at yep. 14 exactly. and he was exactly. stunted. No, we, we had a kid that went from maybe 6th or 7th on our on our pitching roster to the kid I trusted the most. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So you just have to look at the layout, right? Like Major League Baseball teams have a 25-man roster. We carry 10 to 12 kids. Right. Right. They We have a 25-man roster. How many are pitchers? 13. Right. We have four or five, and we expect them to be playing five days out of the week, probably, if you're playing a league on top of tournaments. You expect them to play, what, a fourth? In multiple games I a just, day. I can't 50, stay, 50 games, I a fourth s- of what the Major League Baseball season is, and you have yeah. a fourth of the pitchers that you have? But yeah. less innings also. I, I don't care. Here's less innings. Thing. You're yeah, still. It's it's, still it's, I don't care about innings. Yeah. Pitches matter. Because right. not only on top of that, if you're looking, if you're looking at pitches, and you have a kid that throws 80 pitches in a in a in a in one game, he's done obviously for the rest of this, the tournament. Should be. But how many pitches is he actually throwing? Uh, Warm up pitches, pitches in between innings. Right. I mean, he, you're up over 120. We faced a kid that threw 191 pitches in a tournament. That's child abuse. 100% child abuse. I, I don't even have words There's for that. No, I'm just no. going to sit here and shake my head. Yes. Yeah, yep. that's insulting. I mean, he threw a complete game before he threw against us. Yeah. That's and the kid came out came out there, threw, threw against us, and just got rocked. Yeah. Because he had nothing left. And, and I'm not – I understand the fact that different kids are – different obviously so some kids are probably able to throw more pitches than one of their peers of the same age but to play it safe i feel like we should always go by those guidelines yeah but if you want to take it a step further and really be able to tell the difference between player a and player b and i'm not for putting a radar on eight to ten year old kids or whatever Mm -hmm. but there's good research that once their miles per hour drop consistently below, you know, three below their baseline, that they're fatigued. And once you start pitching with fatigue, you're 36 times more likely to be injured. 
So if I mean, if you really want to radar your kids, <coughs> that's the reason to do it. It's not to see how hard they're throwing; it's to monitor their fatigue level. I'm surprised it's that low. Just three miles per hour? No, no, thirty-six percent. Oh yeah, no, 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 thirty-six times, thirty-six times more. Not thirty-six percent more. Thirty-six times more. What's that like? Thirty-six hundred percent? Yeah. Okay. So that makes uh, that makes more sense. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I misheard you. <laughs> to me, what I took from that, like you know, you're talking about, the, yeah, maybe some kids can. Or have a little bit more ability to go a little bit longer than other kids, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. And, and do you n- know necessarily that right. that's the kid that can go a little bit longer? Right. I mean, just because he's your best pitcher, does that mean that he can go a little bit longer than everybody else? Do you know you're not no. robbing him from 17 and 18 right. at the cost of 12 and 13? Right. The one thing that I don't particularly care for is the way he, he's either, it's either Little League or U-Triple-S-A does it, where it's innings. If he throws a certain amount of innings. Little League. Is it Little League? So if he throws a certain amount of innings, he can't pitch, you know, however So So Little League does it, like, say, say you throw two innings and then you throw one pitch in the third. You are, you have officially thrown three innings, is what they say, and the player cannot pitch then the next day or the right. next two days, whatever it is. Yeah, so I mean, there is some, some research that looks at innings, too, um, and anything beyond 100 innings is – over what kids should be doing in but a year. Innings is so dumb. But I don't it, like innings because it, it it doesn't track the number of times that you're throwing. No, it's it, not it doesn't. Right. No, but the there's innings. also some, and again, we don't have any way to track this necessarily uh, currently. But there's good research to also suggest that it's not just pitches that matter. It's uh, how stressful those pitches are. Meaning, like, what is the situation? If you come in and throw ten pitches with the bases loaded, that's a different effect on a pitcher's arm than 10 pitches with the bases empty. You know, that was, no that, was something, that was something that we brought up with, with Lester when the Cubs won the World Series. Is you try to bring him in during a, for a clean inning. It's a different, I know, but a clean inning where there's less stress, you know, where a pitcher could throw six innings, but he's throwing 100, 100 pitches in those six innings, but how many of those are stressful pitches, if you will? And that's you know that it's definitely something that's already that that's been talked about from major league level on down. Yeah, and, and I would even look at um, Chapman. All right, uh, he was probably used too often as well during that World Series run, but uh, oh, God, he was yeah. in some high leverage situations. And mostly high leverage. Situations. Mostly. And how poorly did he pitch the next season? And I believe he was put on. Oh, the injured list too. Shortly thereafter, for, mo- for most of the season, most he of the was season. garbage or hurt. He couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't. He couldn't <clears throat> touch a hundred. Right yeah. after that was, I mean, he was done. Yeah. So you look at, you know, was that a combination of maybe being pitched too much, too often, and more of an overuse injury, yeah. or was it a, a high leverage situation, or was it a combination of both? Probably. Here's the problem: Andrew. is there's there's no there. I don't think there's a perfect world here. It's no. not, and that's what my that's what ultimately what my question about about you know Chris Sale compared to this other player or whatever it is everyone's going to be different but it's so hard to quantify that difference uh, if, if we're talking sorry if we're talking pitch counts and we have you know s- s- pitchers can pitch certain amount of pitches in the here but then they have to wait a day and then they can only throw a certain amount of pitches on this day you know so it's like okay he can throw 30 pitches and then he needs a day rest and then he can throw another however many how many times do we try and to win the tournament throw 30 throw 30 and then and then throw Saturday, 80 you know okay good good we're pitching friday mm-hmm. we're playing friday instead of saturday sunday so i can throw my best for 30 pitches try to hopefully get a lead and then i can bring him back on the next day on sunday on sunday so here's my other question, and maybe you will know as coaches and have a strong opinion about this one way or the other, but how strong or, or, or how important are pool play games? Like if you're the best team in the tournament, do you really need to play pool play games on Friday, or can you just go into a tournament and just win a tournament because you're the best team in the tournament? The only time pool play games truly matter is if, like, for example, when we played at 8 o'clock in the morning, terrible. Could not win a game at 8 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if that's us or if that's the kids, or the parents, or whatever it is, which it's all three of it, but so that would be that would be one one goal. The second goal would be um, depending on if there's different brackets, different different levels, if you will, gold, silver, whatever you call it. 
So and, and with tournaments as large as they are, they probably have to be separated into different brackets like they that, do. correct? They do. Which yeah. is good. Yeah, because I mean, bad. to me, if you if you win gold and if your your team's just an average team, you win gold in the in the bronze bracket or whatever, like you know, those kids aren't really going to know that either way. They walk right. home with the first place trophy. They think that they did something awesome. right. Yeah. So I, I guess my, my so question or my point was how how often do we you know throw our best kids on Friday because we need a good bracket seating on the weekend. And that's, you know that's what I mean? you're absolutely right. Is how important are those pool play games if you are the best team in the tournament. But I mean this is why I would like to get uh, you know a room full of coaches and, and tournament directors and some of the best minds that we have in the Quad Cities and just say how can we design these things? You know, I'm not trying to take away from anybody or, or, no. or anything that anyone's doing, but how can we design things in a way that protects our kids a little bit more and, and nobody else, you know, gets the short end of the stick. To to your earlier point, that's kind of what I was getting ready to say anyway, was that uh, I kind of have been in that camp a little bit recently myself where I kind of have an idealistic view of I think there could be some really good things that could come from some of these organizations merging and rather than in separating it more into rather than having two double a clubs now we've got one triple a club and one double a club and they're there specifically to serve that purpose like these kids are ready all 12 of them can do everything you need them to do these kids still need some work it's easier said than done though i mean it's, I say, it's, that's always, I say. it's always idealistic gonna have, you're always going to have parental drama right and th but th i think that's and because all they care about is we talked about this last week. My kid. That's my the problem. Kid and winning. That's all. That, that that's the only reason that you have kids. That my kid does not deserve this. Listen to me right now. If a coach is doing, if a good coach is doing something, it's because your kid deserves it. Well, and let me let me really extrapolate on that for a second. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this out there as a hypothetical. Okay, so like let's just say two double A clubs merge. Okay, and you think your kid's pretty dang good, and he make he doesn't make the triple A squad. So then you go off and start your own team. So you're all upset, but you know what? I, me personally, here's how I'm going to look at it. I'm just throwing this out there for people to consider, for these people that could, if you were in that situation, for me personally. Logan, you're incredibly self-aware. Most true. parents are not incredibly self-aware. I agree. But for me, I would look at it on the half-glass full side and think, well, you know what? Maybe my kid's the best, one of the better kids on this double-A squad. He might get some more opportunities. I wouldn't even look at it like that. I would look I'm at just, it. you know, trying to make That's a positive point, spin but, on it. But you know? I would say, well... Kellen, he didn't make it. You didn't make it. This kid showed better than you, or this kid had something better to offer than you did. What's your goal for next year? If you want to make that team, what are you going to do differently to make that team? Right. And that's what that's, are you going to do that's, differently? That's where that's where our kids from. That's where that's where our generation is where we're damaging our children and not making them fight through adversity and to develop then their ability. To overcome, yeah. right. we're giving we're giving it to them. We're saying if you can't make that team, I'm going to go start my own team. Right. No, go down a level. That's not and the yeah, yeah. That's not the right. You response. need to get if your kid needs to get better. Your kid needs to get better. And I don't I don't want to be one of those guys. Who's, you know, back in my day, that, you know, we had all the right answers. But no, absolutely but not. Back but in my day, we, <laughs> you know, you had the travel teams. And if you didn't make the travel team, you play little league, and you played little league, mm -hmm. and you got better, and you tried out for the traveling team next year. Yep. And I, I don't know. I mean, again, I remember right. it goes I remember back to winning, not making the, the the travel team, and just being completely dev devastated by it. Yeah. But my daddy didn't start his own travel team. I just went and played. You went and played little league. Yeah. Because that was what you had to do in order to get better. So, slight change of subject, but not a lot. That's it. it do you guys ever go into tournaments and not care if you win it? Uh, you guys probably do, but are there teams that go into tournaments I, without? No, without we don't ever. We don't ever. We don't ever. We don't ever not okay, want so, to or care to uh, win. We have we have one of our one of our sayings is we hate losing more than we love winning, right? But that doesn't deter us from losing from from caring that we are losing over development. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, do so you ever development is always the most important. Do, do you ever go into tournaments? Or do you think any teams, and I feel like I know this answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you feel like teams ever go into tournaments and say, you know what, this weekend I'm going to pitch my 9 through 12 guys. You know, I'm not going to pitch my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Not a tournament. Yeah. So coaches you're don't, always. Coaches don't do that because 
they're uh, there to win and the parents are there to win. Well, so they're in the pool the play games. In the pool play games, you might you might say, I'm just going to throw this weekend's pool play games away and whatever happens on Sunday happens. Right. But... Yeah, I, I mean, on Sundays, really, it's really hard to just. I totally struggle with not that care. because I'm in control. Like as a as a head coach, I'm in control of developing your kids. Not, yes, but I'm in control of these parents' money. No, no, you are right. That's my <laughs> philosophy. I'm in control of these parents' money, and they are paying me to get these kids to win, develop. But they're they're not paying me, but they're paying to be on this team to have to their get a trophy to, to get a trophy. And go to the store and buy them a trophy. Then. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, no, but, I, you know, I, but mean, I, will, I won't do that because trophies to me are the worst thing that that existed because because your shirt says it all. Participation trophies. Yeah. Ever since that was introduced, our kids have just become babies. Yeah, and, and I mean this probably isn't the right way to discuss it any further, but I'm just brainstorming ways that we can make the system health friendly. To say to say f the pool play games. Let's. Try to win uh, I think, more efficiently. I think that there could be there could be better ways where, and I hate the way that rankings get put into play, like Illinois, etc. I I don't like that necessarily. But that's it. That's, nine that's, U. Why am I getting? Why are we? Oh, we're the best double A team in nine U. What I, the I hell is that? I get that. But there is a way. Right. There is a way to potentially do that, and make it a. And make it a tournament where. I'm not. I'm here to not just play three games. I'm here not just to win it. I'm I'm playing this because this is going to help my my the players o- develop. The only way you I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get away from the pool play games where the pool play games don't matter or they matter too much. Yeah. So current state, and I'll just say this: I, I think current state right now, the way that we have it, is fine. If parents take responsibility for their child's health and they know some of these things, right? So Mm -hmm. because you as a coach, you feel obligated to quote unquote, give parents their money's worth, right? So I feel obligated to, okay. So, so he's he's right. He's not wrong, but I feel obligated in my perspective. I feel obligated to provide the best opportunity for their, for these players. Yeah, but, but I'm just saying, you know, if, but yes. you know, universally speaking, not your team, but just universally speaking, if parents knew the guidelines of how many pitches to pitch, yada, 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 and they go up to the coach and they say, hey, Timmy can't pitch today because he pitched 40 on Friday and he's done till Monday. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm okay with that. I don't want you to throw Timmy today. Does that change? Does that change the way that we do things? It, it would open dialogue with that, the coach is something that we preach anyway. Yeah, it is. And I was open with my parents. Whenever I had a pitch count thing, every parent knew. Yeah. My it, coaches knew, everyone knew because because I want them keeping me accountable too. Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the biggest things that I you know, I've been trying to do for the last couple of years and you know, I hope that your podcast is another avenue for us to reach more people. But it, that's what I want is I want parents to know kind of what those guidelines are because right now they kind of I feel as though they go in a little bit blind as to the risks and how some of those risks are enhanced when we overuse our players like it's great that Timmy's the best player on the team and it's great that Timmy's the best pitcher and we all want what's best for Timmy but sometimes I feel like there's maybe a mixed message between coaches and parents where coaches feel like the parents want to win just as much as everybody else does when maybe sometimes there's just some miscommunication where the parent is like, they just don't know what their kids should or shouldn't be doing. And maybe if they just knew that and then they could say, Hey, this is where we're at. Did you know this? Are you aware? Let's handle it this way today because it's my kid at the end of the day. Right. And once you get to an older level where kids are 14, 15, 16, then I'd love for kids to have that knowledge too. And just Mm -hmm. be like, Hey coach, I'm out today. You know, I I can't pitch today. I'll, would love to play shortstop or third base or wherever you need me, whatever I can do to help the team. So but I can't pitch. So what's the difference in playing? I know it's not I know it's not as frequent of use, but you brought up um, in the last episode the two minute, you know, your arm starts to lose its range of motion. Lose its range of motion after two minutes of not throwing. Now is that just pitching or 
if I'm playing shortstop and I get a ball hit to me in the first inning, I get a ball hit to me in the third inning, I get a ball hit to me in the sixth inning, whatever it is, I'm making these throws, but I have longer than two minutes between each throw. Yeah, so it's only been studied in pitchers. I think, you know, logically it would make sense that it's also position players as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, you're not going to see kids out in the field probably doing yeah l- small arm circles uh but but i wouldn't it, be opposed to that but you have to look at yeah but they look ridiculous they would look ridiculous they would but look i don't ridiculous. care but if everybody's doing it do they look as ridiculous or does right. it just become Sports, the new right. norm right you know what i mean if once you have a, nice a coach that walks up to you why why are that? your players doing small arm circles well, yeah, to keep their arms safe and then you tell them and then that team does it yeah you know what i mean and that's how things Oh, spread. we're bringing this to Chris, bro. But I, I don't know, to answer your question, I don't know if it's that big of a deal with position players just because of the volume of throwing. Right. You know what I mean? Like one throw across the infield, n- not as stressful as 40 pitches in a row. Yes. And, you, and you're an advocate of you reach that that threshold for pitchers, and then that pitcher – Goes right back to the catcher position, right? Uh, that is incorrect. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with that? Actually, the only the only research that has found any correlation between pitching and then going to a separate position is the catcher. So, uh, a pitcher should not be a catcher in the same game. Day. And and really, I would probably say all weekend long. If if your catcher pitches, they should. Probably not be even for that day, at least. You know, if you have three or four games, you don't want them to be involved thro- with every pitch. They're throwing just the rest as many. of the time. Yeah. So stress level again, and though. stress level at sometimes is even higher because you're trying to throw the ball to second base with probably terrible mechanics because you're trying to throw them fr- from your knees because you got to get it out quick. You right. know, whatever, yeah. depending on the level that you're working with. Right. So, um, so yeah. That's the only position that I would not want a pitcher to go to after the game. That's the only one that's been proven to have any enhanced injury risk is if you go from pitcher to catcher or catcher to pitcher. It's but you can go to shortstop, actually. So yeah. that one was kind of surprising to me because, you know, you always think is the pitcher being the most athletic kid most of the time and then, you know, going over to shortstop. But surprisingly, that there hasn't been any research to, to correlate any increased injury risk with pitching and then going to shortstop so that's good news but again so my question then is on top of that just just to kind of lead off that if you have a pitcher that throws 40 50 60 pitches whatever it is ideally they would come off they would then move to the bench and they would be done for the rest of the game at the very least for them right ideally ideally 25 man roster yeah (laughs) i I think that would be great at a youth level great good luck with that realistically right yeah that's that's just not going to happen so that's why i think it's important to know that Catching is the place that they can't go. They can't go wherever you want to put them. And let's it, let's make no sure let's make sure we emphasize right that. Now. After you pitch, you can't go catch. Can't go catch. I would like that to be a rule in tournaments. There, it, it it should be. It's, it it's a suggestion. There are some there are some that have it, but how often are they enforcing it? Enforced. You know, here, and it's the same the thing, thing with would, with pitch rules. Yeah, you write the pitch count on the back of a card. Yeah, it says, well, they can finish their batter if they reach this pitcher. <laughs> if they reach this, you know, finish the batter if they reach this pitch count. I get all those things because you don't want to you don't want to slow the game down necessarily. But still, nonetheless. 50-minute time limits are rough. They, it, 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 some of the time limits get a little bit hard. But... I, I would I would be an advocate of them not going to the left side of the diamond at all. You know You're talking outfield, second base. Outfield, second first base, base, first base. You know, the the longer But I would still say throw. I would still say though that outfield can be just as just as painful because it's a it's the longest throw on the diamond. Right. Unless you're going out and cutting it off properly. Right, right. We're but, getting into too much detail. There's something I want to reel us back into okay. with why we have Rusty here, because I know we're running up probably a little bit against it. But you brought up something on Facebook about looking at kids and taking their um, and taking their their mechanics and finish that for me. Kinematic sequencing. There you go. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it goes back to injury risk and, and decreasing the amount of risk in 
kids, especially when they're pitching. And we can go back to Chris Sale even and talk about, you know, there are certain biological factors that we don't even know about that probably play some sort of risk or some some sort of um, play into whether or not that kid gets injured. But why not decrease the amount of risk as much as possible, right? So mm-hmm. it may be that your child can throw like Chris Sale and never get injured. Right. The likelihood of that. Yeah, right. More likely is that they will get injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we can do is look at the video of a kid throwing and be able to look at their kinematic sequencing and see whether or not they may be at some sort of increased risk for injury. So there's several different points within the pitching mechanics that we can look at. And it, each one of those, the player should be at a certain point. All right. So kinematic sequencing is basically just the way that the body moves and at what time does the, mo- does the body move to that position. <coughs> Staying on schedule. <coughs> How long do I have? <laughs> no, 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 not you. Oh. He always emphasizes staying on schedule oh, with your, yeah, pitch, yeah, yeah. your your pitch mechanics. Yeah, stay on schedule. Don't don't rush. Don't rush your leg coming down. Don't rush your shoulder move or your your arm going forward. Don't rush these things. Stay on schedule. Keep the same routine that you do every time. Right. Yep. But yeah, that's the sequencing part of it. Yeah. So practice the word kinematic sequencing, <laughs> and you can sound really smart. But if you want to stay on schedule, you can do that too. But so, so, I, I, see, I tried. I, I tried, and I'm never going to get it. There, so there are different points throughout the throw that basically I look for and to see where kids are at with their pitching mechanics and whether or not they're achieving those positions at the right time. And we kind of alluded to it earlier, and it's been so long now, I don't remember which podcast this was on, but <laughs> we talked a little bit about kids just moving athletically. Okay. And knowing that their body is always going to take the path of least resistance. That was on the first one. That so was on part one. What we would do in analyzing video of these kids is to basically just make sure that they're not achieving those positions through compensatory strategies, right? They're not using muscles that should be stabilizing the shoulder to move the shoulder essentially. So just looking to see that things are moving the way that they should be moving at the time that they should be moving there. That's okay. the first time I've ever heard the word compensatory not related to a draft pick. <laughs> ah. Welcome so, to physical therapy. So <laughs> I want uh, just a quick just a quick review. I only have one angle. I want to hear what you would tell somebody after looking at a uh, their pitching sequence. So who am I looking at? This is Kellen. It's my son. Oh, this looks awful. I know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> hold on. I, I, I got to awesome. figure out your phone. Okay. So first off, I always have to look in slow motion. So I have to figure out your phone and figure out how that I can, absolutely how I can do that. Cause full speed's harder, but so I'm going to look at how he loads that back leg first. So right now he's lifting his leg in the air. I'm looking at whether or not he's loading this hip appropriately from the angle that you're showing me. And because it's dark in your living room right now, I can't necessarily see exactly what's going on. But what I want to see that leg do is internally rotate, meaning that I want to see his thigh rotate inward. Okay, so his knee will kind of come in a little bit, but that will position his hip to fire the glutes so that he can really push off the mound with his glute muscles. What are you doing? Making the assi- A different video. Okay. So Sorry. this one, do you feel like he's going 100% right here? Do you, do you well, feel like he, I mean, obviously he's he throwing a, a fake baseball a in your living step. room. So, so yeah, oh, it's no, kind he, of a slide step right now. He doesn't load that back leg much at all. Okay. So I would want to see that leg rotate in a little bit and give a little bit more push off of that leg. Okay. And looking compensatory wise, just to bring it all around full circle, is he using the muscles more on the side of his hip that are generally weaker or is he positioning his leg into a position where he can use his glutes 
and more of his muscles mm-hmm. to be able to drive his body forward. Okay. God forgive me for this, but I've heard coaches use the term sit on the bucket. Is that what you're talking about? Um, I don't really know. I don't know what you mean by, by rotating. Well, that's head. what that's, I was going to ask them the question just to, to ask because that's what step one is you're looking at you're looking at the legs it's, yeah so that's like the first thing that i'm looking at right so and obviously is there a video out there is that there shows what you're there? looking for that kind of shows this kinematics could i literally pull it up on youtube and say this is kinematic sequencing and this is what Rus- Ru- rusty is talking about you can probably not pull it up just by like searching for that particular thing okay um i'm sure there are videos out there of like major league pitchers no, that do it very well i don't want that because i don't want the wrong message i want something that's from like a medical standpoint does that make sense yeah uh, so and there are guys that do it right from a medical standpoint you can't just go up and like pull up any old guy on the internet and say yep that's what i'm looking for are you telling me that i should make youtube videos so that people can just go on and and look at these things individually no, no. I'm wondering if there's an example out there that would I don't be, know of would one be off the top of my head. Okay, I didn't know if I didn't say no if your your employer had something like that, or if your 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 instructor that you had for this uh, f- for your last session. I feel like you're telling me to do it. I feel you like, want me to do it. I feel like I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we probably I, I am will not. I am not the telling you to do it. I'm, I'm more hinting at let's do it. Yeah, there you go. I I, yeah. I, will, I will get a video camera and we will. We will bust this out, dude. Yeah, we might be able to do that together. For sure. Yeah. So I don't know, <laughs> again, that I can begging. tell I you on a podcast without showing you. So I know that it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to the listener. but It didn't because when okay. you said rotating your, that, that thigh I picture, inwards a little picture, bit. I picture yeah. front leg rotating and I don't yeah, But he's talking about like his back that. leg back rotating leg, a little bit. Load leg. So for a right hand, So that knee's going to drop right in a leg. little bit, essentially. Yeah. So he's, he's on his back leg. The back leg is bending. I look at the other guy. He's going to show you. Yeah, kind of like that. Get ready with, for your drive position. Like the crazy jump at the yeah. end, but yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah, so kind of, uh, kind of sitting down on that back leg and having that knee turn in a little bit. Where it gets, and I know this is a hitting term, but gets to a launch position yeah. where you're able to lurch yourself. Forward Correct. instead of okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Again, and it's the, more it's more loading on that back leg. I, got, like, I, like I, I, I about. get what you're saying. This okay. is something that we we've actually discussed before, and it's something that we've actually had a, a bit of debate about. Where and we talk about this a lot. Where when's the right time to introduce the certain things to the kids, age wise? Uh, for example, if you're teaching eight year olds who are very first learning how to pitch, that might not be the first thing you want to go to. Because uh, it might just confuse the crap out of them, where you might want to just get them where they can stand on a balance point first. Well, you don't want to use the term kinetic sequencing with an eight-year-old because well, I, you get what I'm saying. Well, you can't <laughs> use it with Coach Patrick. No. So, <laughs> so I I think how you would do it best is you don't worry about explaining it, but you have drills and things for kids to do that put them in the correct position. So you're not waiting to introduce it as much as you are at the time that they're learning how to pitch they're not you're not just putting them on the mound and saying okay it's you're going to pitch now and letting them throw naturally necessarily because again body takes path the least resistance they're going to do whatever they can to make that ball go as hard as they can mm-hmm. right that's just what they're naturally going to want to do because they're competitors so you put them through drills that put them into the proper positioning so that that becomes natural kinematic sequencing for them and then it just becomes a thing you never have to explain it because I mean, that's why we do drills as coaches, right? Plan, we we do drills. You wait for it to water. You yes. wait for it to water. You wait for it to wait grow. For, you I, water I'm gonna it say, to grow. I'm going to say you plan it to to watch it water. I don't feel like that's right. To watch, you plant well, it, you water it, and then you watch no, it grow. No. When oh. you plant it, you're watering it, and then you watch it grow. You said it wrong. I'm not a botanist, so Ob- obviously we're going to need to get or, a botanist or a here. wordsmith. We've established <laughs> a lot of. So, so I feel professions like that we are not. I feel like something something that you're an advocate of, and this is what I would do after listening to you. Can I just say that that only like tipped the iceberg? Like that was like a five minute conversation about the very first thing I know that I look at. I know, and that's and, and that's that's all that I wanted <laughs> because I wanted to show people what you have to offer and what you can bring in. Um, 
but but to that point, if we start, if we're talking about eight year olds, it is something you don't, you can't explain it to them. You have to show them what to do. I have, what is wrong with not even giving them a ball, and then showing them the proper mechanics, if you will, starting with that the the right balance point, the right leg drive, the right the right sequencing sequencing. Because and it's, using that because it's boring and nobody wants to do it that way. <laughs> you're, you're exactly right. Like that's what that, at eight years at, old. That's when you'd start doing that. That's what you should do. And I would even say, looking at older kids, because as the season goes, we're throwing hundreds of pitches, and sometimes kids fall into bad habits that aren't easy to correct in the mm-hmm. middle of a season. But I think if you get a really solid pitching coach or instructor or somebody that is just a huge fan of of stuff like this that in the winter time this is when you do corrective stuff mm-hmm. right and because i'm also an advocate of not playing for three to four months not throwing a baseball for mm-hmm. three to four months then after how, throwing for four months straight right so then how do you stay active in baseball without because that's the biggest thing right everybody wants their kids to just keep playing so that they continue to get better and they mm-hmm. don't want to give them the time off which one is proven not to be effective anyway but that's right. a different conversation but that's what they should be doing in the winter months when they shouldn't be throwing is they should be going through kind of these dry drills so to speak without a ball and just doing these corrective exercises and you know getting some of that range of motion back that they maybe had Took lost the throughout the season mouth. or um yeah just fixing their their posture or their sequencing or however you want to frame it but I'm, that's what you do in the winter months in my opinion i'm a you big advocate it. for the two things that you just said they're dry swings and pitching mechanics a because a lot of these kids do you have you know the room in your house to throw a baseball no but you can go through your pitching you know mechanics in a room without a baseball same with swings uh and also um in regards to your other point there um I'm a big fan of the less coaching in a game. Like, or not, I shouldn't say coaching, the less teaching. Instruction. Instruction, Instruction in a game, the better. I think we're all guilty of that. Right? Oh, God, every, yeah. every coach is. I mean, every coach. There's not a coach in the world that hasn't said, that tried to instruct a kid in the middle of a game. Guys, we're going to sit here and we're going to tell you this every podcast. We're going to say, don't coach in the middle of a game. Don't instruct your kids during the middle of a game. And then you're going to come watch one of my games and I'm going to be instructing <laughs> in the middle of a game. Oh, yeah, God, yes. Because it's so hard not to. Right. right. You, see a, you see a mechanical a mechanical issue, you want to fix it. That's Listen to what I say, not what I do. Come yeah. on. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, if they're thinking about mechanical things in the middle of a, a game, that's you're giving them too much to think about at that point in time, I think. All right. Yep, I agree 100%. We're getting so close to it here, as guys. As you said, five-minute conversation, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. Like, this isn't even the part that, you know, like we haven't even dove, dove into where Titanic hit kind of thing. Right. So I'm an advocate for doing more of this. I don't know if you are. I don't know if you want to continue talking on these points. I don't know if you what I don't know what you want to do, but that's something we can talk about off the air. However, I would be more than willing to do this again and again and again until we get through these points. I'll be here. You know where to find me. Sweet. With that being said, hang hang on, hang on. No. Real, real quick, I'm sorry. We're 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 done. I just want to I just want to reiterate something that we didn't state outright. Kid says, Coach, my arm hurts. Okay. Done. Right? I, I would say done unless you have the training to be able to deduce whether or not that that's an injury. So if your arm hurts, you're done. And then if it's gone the next day, he's good to go. But if what it still hurts what the next day. again? Still done? Come see me. How okay. much? How much does that know? How much does that go along with knowing your kids? And okay, he's being he's being a crazy. He's being over dramatic. He's being a baby. Yeah. Does just, his arm really just hurt? don't be wrong uh-huh. when you do that, right? That's the biggest thing that I see is people brush it off, thinking, "Oh, it's nothing." You know, he's he, he's always hurt. No big deal. And then it's that one time that they brush it off that you just gave the kid a rotator cuff tear. Mm. Uh, real quick to reiterate, too, I think – I don't know that how clearly we mentioned this, but seriously, if you're worried about your kid's arm health, which you should be, uh, take some videos, and Rusty is willing to take a look at him. And at this moment, he's willing to do this out of the kindness of his heart. Uh, that I can't say that's always going to be the case. At some point in time, he might be charging for the services, so I suggest if you're interested in something like that, uh, you take advantage while you can. Yep, 100% free of charge. 
So you can reach out through you guys and, and we can kind of figure that out. Yep. But just well, you can also find them on Facebook too. Yeah, you can probably find me on Facebook. Just don't judge me by my Facebook posts. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Thou shall be judged. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Rusty, thanks again. Yes. We're going to do this some more. So much. I know that for sure. Appreciate it so much. I have no else. idea. I'm so excited. Yep. Check us out on coachablecast.com, on Facebook, facebook.com slash coachablecast, Podbean. We got on coachablecast.podbean.com. It's all on our website, so you'll get there every, anywhere you want to. Patreon, Twitter. Let's be able to give back. Give back so. Go to all of them. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening, guys. Later. Love you. See you.